Elie Wiesel and his family were deported to Auschwitz when he was 15 years old. His mother and one of his three sisters died there. His father died later at Buchenwald. He is the author of more than 30 books, including his unforgettable international bestseller, Night and a Beggar in Jerusalem, which won a number of prizes. He has been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States Congressional Gold Medal, the French Legion of Honor, and in 1986, the Nobel Peace Prize. He is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of the Humanities and University Professor at Boston University. He lives with his wife, Marion, in New York City. He is much more than his biography, much more than his prizes. He is much more than what he writes. He is, for so many people, the one who gives testament and testimony uh, to those who have, who have died and who demands memory of those who were victims of the Holocaust and who is the voice of the survivor. He has now written his memoir, it is called All Rivers Run to the Sea. There will be another volume because this takes him from birth in Transylvania to 1969 when he gets married here in the United States. He's my friend and I'm very pleased to have him on this broadcast. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Let me go back uh, to Transylvania. Sighet? Sighet, yeah. Sighet, yeah. You uh, your father, Shlomo, a rabbi. No, he was a, he was a learned man, yeah. but he owned a grocery store. But otherwise, he learned every day, a learned naturally. Man, he could have been a rabbi, but yeah. he, he was a But he was a learned man. Very learned man. Yeah. You were, tell me about you growing up as a young man there, as a very young man. Oh, I grew up in a very religious family, and in a way, very happy. I had a mother, I had a father, I had sisters, I had friends, I had teachers, and I had books. I always loved books. I loved books more than, than walking in the street and playing. I never played anything. I never played any, any sport or any games, nothing. Just books study. were your love. Just, just study. And uh, all I, I remember really is going to school or coming from school or being in school. Occasionally I would help my father, everybody else would. In, in the grocery store before holidays. And uh, I had a grandfather in a small village nearby. And it was, but I, I used to go and see him twice a year for during the holidays. Yeah. And to go from my little town, Siget, to this little village, Bichger, seven kilometers, four, yeah. four miles, it was an expedition. Oh, yeah. Much I, more than I, now to take a Concord and go to uh, Paris. Well, I, I remember going from one village to another in, in a small town in North Carolina. You were a little bit of a mystic, or you were fascinated by mysticism. Uh, the secret, the forbidden territory, has always fascinated those who study, and of course I was fascinated by it. And the problem is that it's forbidden to study mysticism, Kabbalah, before a certain age, 30 or 40, yeah. or before you are a very great scholar. I was neither a great scholar <laughs> nor an yeah. old man, but I wanted to study. And luckily we had in my town a, a Kabbalist called Kalman, and he taught Kabbalah, and he accepted me as a student. We were three, actually, three students. Mm -hmm. And it was an adventure, because Kabbalah means to acquire power, mystical power, to bring the Messiah. And we wanted to bring, bring the Messiah. The Messiah. Yes. <laughs> and believe it or not, there is even a kind of manual You're saying how yeah, to. How to bring the Messiah. How to bring the Messiah. <laughs> which means you fast Monday and Thursday. My poor parents didn't know why I was fasting. You, know? you bring the Messiah. I didn't say that. I know it was forbidden to say oh, It's yeah. a secret. Yeah. But I didn't eat. I was always like that. I never yeah. ate much. And it was something to, to bring the Messiah. And then yeah. my father, who was a rationalist, really uh, heard about it. And he said, aren't you afraid? I said, of course not, really, you know. As long as I learned, as I studied, he was all right. And he, he accepted. But then the tragedy occurred. One of the three lost his mind. Mm. And a professor of psychiatry came from the nearby big town, Satmar, and then from Budapest. And then the professor from Budapest invited the professor from Stockholm, a first certain Oliver Krona, a famous man. He came, he tried to understand, he couldn't understand. What does he know about Kabbalah? <laughs> I didn't tell him, nobody told him. <laughs> and the, my friend, who, who went yeah. insane, of course, didn't speak. He was 
suffering from aphasia. He went back very unhappy. Then a few months later, the second one lost his mind. Again, same thing, psychiatrist, from yeah. there, from yeah. there, Oliver Kona came back. And couldn't find out, he left back very unhappy, and I remained alone. Then my father said, aren't you afraid? I said, no, of course not, and I was. Yeah. Continued, but then the Germans came in. Yeah. And I'm convinced had the Germans not come in at that time, I too would have lost my sanity. Because really, it is not for children. Yeah. The, the, the extraordinary beauty of the text, of the imagery that, that you get, that you receive, and what the cosmos, we are dealing with the cosmos. And yeah, what happened to the two that went insane? They were among the first to be taken, and of course they were vanished, they vanished yeah. in the fires of, of Auschwitz. And your remembrance, was there a sense of impending doom and fear and no. that the Germans were coming and... Not until they came. You see, we in this little town, we didn't know what was happening in, in the, the world. world. Because everybody at one point knew already about Auschwitz, except Hungarian Jews. That's why occasionally I'm so angry. And tonight, you know, it's a very special night, Charlie. This is a commemoration, anniversary of the, the Kristall Night. Right. The night of the broken glass. And for the first time, you know, hundreds of, of store, Jewish stores were ransacked, synagogues burned, Jews uh, killed. There was a watershed, really, in, 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 in the Nazi attitude towards Jews. And somehow, we were abandoned. The Hungarian Jewish community could have been safe. Because we were deported, as I write it here. I wrote, March 19, the Germans came in. We were deported March seven, uh, May 17, two weeks or three weeks before D-Day. Mm. If the Allies really had bombed the railways to Auschwitz, thousands and thousands of Jews would have been saved. At that time, the, the Germans were, were burning 10,000 men, women, and children every day, every night. That hurts. You went to Auschwitz on a cattle car. Yes, that was the way all Jews went, except a few Jews who were lured by the Germans. They had, you know, they had, they had their own psychology, they had warfare psychology, how to lure people. So let's say from Italy or from Greece, they took them in ice cars, in uh, passenger cars, uh, trains, but we were in cattle cars. And you were told what by your father? We could have them too. We were in the ghetto first for two months, and uh, we had a marvelous maid, a Christian woman, marvelous woman called Maria. She lived in a village. And she came into the ghetto and she pleaded with us, come with me. I have a hut in the mountains. Come, you have enough, all of you, the entire family. Had we known about Auschwitz, we would, we would have gone with her. But we didn't know. So what did you think? Oh, we thought what we were told, that we were only going to Hungary, to a, to a kind of family camp in Hungary, because the front was coming uh, nearer and nearer. The, the, the Russian front was 20 miles away, 30 miles away. And we, we were told that because of the front, they are simply the, taking all the Jews away into camps, Hungarian camps in Hungary. Had we known about Auschwitz? No doubt. So this poor Maria, whom I remember with great gratitude, she was a marvelous, admirable human being. And she didn't win, but Eichmann won. And you later covered the Eichmann trial with Hannah Arendt and other people. Yes. Uh, more about that later. But your mother and two sisters. No, my mother, three sisters, two older ones and one younger one. And my mother and the younger one, and my grandmother, were taken that night, the very first night. Never saw them again? No, I, we know they, they gas that night. First night? Very first night. And what I try to say here, in a few words, you know, that the pain, that I, we didn't even say goodbye to each other. And I see, I, when I close my eyes, I see them always walking, walking. Walking away. Walking away in the crowd. I see my little sister, whom I love more than I can say. When I speak about her, I cry. Mm. And I saw them walking away. Uh, we found out soon after, of course. You found out? Yes, mm. because that very night, 
the inmates who were in charge of receiving us and breaking us in, so to speak, they told us, you see, the flames, the cemetery of an entire people was in those flames. Your dad, when you were 16, Bukhanov. Yes, but you know, my dad and I at home, I didn't see him that often because he was always either in the store, mm -hmm. I was studying, and he was always involved in community affairs. If I, I think about it today, if I'm so involved now in helping, trying to help people, it's because of him. I inherited that from him. And my father was always, therefore, busy with helping people. And often I was so eager to be alone with him, you know, to be alone and he, tell him stories, listen to his stories. But yet, no time. Inside Auschwitz, we became so close because we had no, no one else. I was all he had and he was all I had. And one of the reasons I'm sure why I lived is because I was afraid that if I died, he would die. Same thing for him. He wanted to live because of me. And when in Buchenwald, finally, he did die, I did not continue to live. It wasn't life. That's why in my first memoir, Night, right. a few pages, about three months, because it, I didn't feel alive. Numb. I was paralyzed. Somehow. My life was the life of a paralyzed person. Everything in me was paralyzed. My thought process was paralyzed. The brain was paralyzed. My soul was paralyzed. I functioned without knowing what I was doing because he wasn't there. You end up, after the war, in a French orphanage. In children's homes. In orphanage French home. Yeah. What did France come to mean for you? Oh, it was, for me, it was very special. First, we were waiting a little bit, you know, in Buchenwald, maybe yeah. we, we checked the lists. Right. Maybe somebody remained and I didn't find my sister's names, the older sisters. I felt, well, why go home? Why go back? And I went to France together with 400 young people. The oldest one was 16, the youngest one was eight, who is now the chief rabbi of Israel. Yes. And uh, it was a challenge, of course. I didn't know a word of French. Now all my books are written in French. Furthermore, it was something new uh, for the first time. We were in, 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 in touch with, with women who were, who were you know, educators and so forth. And immediately, immediately, first of all, I became, re became very religious, extremely religious, just as before. But in the meantime... But you must have had very different questions. I had now. terrible questions, of course. But what kind of God on, and how do you find... What humanity, what, what kind of humanity is this that allows such tragedies, such crimes to be committed. And uh, You've what never about, answered that, have you? I have no answer. All the questions I had there really remained open. They what remain about open culture? Today. Of course. What about culture? Yeah. The killers were cultured persons, educated persons. Some of them had PhDs. When I discovered, you know, the Einsatzkommandos who were the worst because they did Babi Yar and Pinsk, they killed with machine guns, not even with gas. Some of them had doctoral degrees in, in arts, in medicine, in theology. I couldn't believe it, but they did it. So I, what is culture? Why, why be educated? Why go to the Sorbonne? Why study? Because education is supposed to be a civilizing influence on you. It's, it's supposed, supposed to, to be. give you a sense of your connection right. with the, the trend, the, the evolution of civilization. That it was supposed to be a place. shield. Yes. Civilization and a grounding. Is there. And nothing. And God, of course, I was much too religious not to question God. So I had all that, and at the same time, in one of the houses, at one point already, I became a choir conductor, too, you know, and uh, I fell in love with every girl I met. <laughs> and some of them fell in love with you, too. I didn't know that. <laughs> I really didn't know that. No? No, believe me, I didn't. I swear to you. If I had known, I, 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 I would have blushed even more. <laughs> but I fell in every single girl. I fell in love. Some of them were, of course, more beautiful than others, so I fell in love with greater fervor. Yes, of course. But I was so shy. Yeah. I was, 
I remember what I used to do to these girls, my poor, these poor girls. I was convinced that the only way to get a girl is to talk philosophy. Yes. <laughs> so I bored them to death with philosophy, you know, with Kant and Spinoza. And did it work? <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> Why do you write in French? This book was written in French. All my books are written in yes. French. And usually they are translated by, by Marion, yes. my wife, right. who translates admirably well. This book, she simply supervised the translation, sent a lot, she worked on the translation. I owe it to her. Whatever is in English, really, I owe it to my wife, who has a marvelous ear for languages. Yeah. But I remain with French, because I, I acquired the French language in France, and I needed a new language. It, yeah. I, I, I needed it like a home, a new home. The great Francois Mauriac was responsible for you publishing had a huge influence on you. Why did he take an interest in you? I'm really perhaps much too uh, modest to know the answer. I came to him as a journalist and I came under false pretenses. Yeah. I wanted to meet Mendes France, to yes. interview Mendes France. I was working for an Israeli, poor Israeli newspaper. And Mendes France didn't want to give me an interview. So I went, I thought I would go to Moriac. Moriac will help, yes. But Moriac, was a great Christian, one of those Christians that you are proud of because they are men of faith mm. and generosity. And uh, he was in love with Jesus, really in love with Jesus. He, he spoke more of Jesus than of God. And whatever I would ask, it was Jesus. And I would say, what about uh, Indochina, for instance? Oh, civil war, <laughs> like in the time of Jesus. Oh, war. <laughs> but if only Jesus was Jesus here. Jesus was at peace. <laughs> and at one point, when I finally said Men about Mendes France, thinking he would say something, he said, oh, Mendes France now is being uh, tortured, tormented by his enemies, just like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> at which point I became very, very discourteous. And to this day, I'm sorry. Discourteous. Discourteous. I've never been discourteous. Yeah. But you say that if he had not found a publisher for you, because you... That because first of all, when he said that, yeah. I said, Mr. Moriak, 10 years ago, I knew Jewish children who suffered more than Jesus suffered on the cross, and we don't talk about it. And I got up and I left. I was at the elevator, he came after me. He pulled me back into the same room. He sat down, made me sit down, and he began to weep. Yeah. I felt hell. I deserved hell, and I was in hell, because he was a good man, one of the very few who never collaborated, who was a courageous man and a generous man. And then, without saying a word, we haven't spoken, he took me to the elevator, embraced me, and he said, maybe you should speak about it. Yes. That's when I wrote, and he became my, my protector. Speaking of collaboration, Francois Mitterrand. Oh, that is a very sad story for me. Who's dying as we speak. Dying of cancer. Yes. And he and I were very close friends for many, many years. I saw in him a living symbol of the resistance. I saw in him a man of honesty, of decency, of humanity, always defending human rights. I thought he was incapable of telling a lie. One of those statesmen, really, who are the, the pride and the honor of their craft. And I didn't know until it came out last year that for one year, he worked for Vichy. I didn't know that after the war, he became a friend of really? René Bousquet. Yes. René Bousquet was a chief of police under the occupation, under Laval's order, and he was responsible for the deportation of all the French Jews, men, women, and children. And Mitterrand was his friend. <sighs> and he denies it. He doesn't deny it. No, but he, what does he deny? Because you've asked him. Sure. 
Um, he didn't deny that, that he saw him. He simply said, he wasn't my friend. I said, but you saw him. Said, what do you mean you saw him? He came to you, you invited him home. You went to the restaurant with him. He said, but we never, as we say in French, tu toi. We didn't say tu to each other, which is something very, very uh, familiar, I can vu. Yeah. All you wanted him to do I was said, to admit. Of course, and I said to him, you know, the president, it's so easy. Next time you are on television, you simply say, I was young and stupid. That's all. When you are young, you do stupid things. But admit it that afterwards, I have done other things. I said, say that because it's true. And then people will turn the page. He said, I did nothing wrong. Nothing wrong? Nothing wrong. Why do you think he said that? Because he really feels it, first of all. He really feels that nothing he, He's wrong. not lying to himself. He actually has convinced himself that... I think so. ...that if he, if he knew, he chose not to know. He said very strange things then, once on television. He said that he didn't know that there were anti-Jewish laws in France, which was very strange because everybody knew about those laws. What did this do to your friendship with him? It hurt our friendship very much. In fact, afterwards, I haven't seen him again. He was asked once, did he convince you? Didn't. He said, no, he didn't. I don't know. I don't know. No, no, he didn't. He didn't. He invited me to go with him to Berlin, to Berlin, with his last speech at the, the 50th anniversary of the end of the war, and to Moscow, and I refused to go. of my very painful periods in my life. You also knew during that time, you knew of at least Camus. Yes, Steven. but he wasn't, he wasn't, I wasn't, Jean he Paul was, Sartre. I mean, he was, they were so great and I yeah. was so small. I knew, I saw them, I met them, I read them, I studied them, <laughs> but they were not close. I read somewhere where somebody said that, that uh, Raymond Aron was right about everything. <laughs> And Sartre, and Sartre was, was wrong, wrong about everything. everything. Same thing with Camus. Camus. Camus was, was right. wrong about everything. Camus was right about, about everything. Right about everything. And yeah. Sartre was wrong about everything. Yeah. And nevertheless, Sartre was a great influence then because he was a great yeah. writer, a great philosopher, a great playwright, everything. And, but at the end of his life, Sartre was honest and he admitted his shortcomings. Yeah. He realized that he didn't really do anything to the end. He didn't accomplish much. You then came to the United States in, what, 60? In the, no, no, 56. 56. I, I was, I then, I, I, I became a journalist, right. first in Yiddish, and then I, I, I was sent by a French paper to Israel in 49 mm. to cover the uh, immigration from the DP camps. And I went there for a few months and uh, came back to Paris, remained a foreign correspondent in Paris for that poor paper, which became rich when I left it. <laughs> and uh, then they sent me to New York for a year. And shortly after I arrived, I was here, I was really devastated because I, I, I made $160 a month, including everything, hotel, restaurant, bus, and, and the shoemaker or something. And uh, shortly after I arrived, I used to go every evening to the New York Times to pick up the Times and steal from the Times, as everybody else does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and a car ran over, a taxi ran over me. Yeah. And uh, it was funny. I, I lost count, of course, I was in a coma. But the, the, the ambulance came late, took me to the nearest hospital, and the hospital checked my pockets and realized that I'm a refugee, and I have no money and no insurance. They put me back on the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> and the ambulance went to, to look for hospitals. <laughs> like in Pirandello wrote a play, you know, six characters in search of an author. There was an ambulance in search of a hospital. <laughs> Who have been the, the influential figures in your life? Who have been those that have shaped your... We know what shaped your experience, <coughs> but what... Of course, my, my, my grandfather, my father, and mother, and uh, my rabbi, boy, yeah, helped me. But in my intellectual development, I would say, uh, there was a man, Shoshani, a yeah. crazy guy in France, who spoke 30 languages and everything by heart. And I became... He was a kind of, of, of guru. A Zen, a Zen Buddhist guru. He wanted to destroy me in order to build me again. And then, here in the United States, a man named Saul Lieberman. He was director of the uh, Jewish Logical Seminary, one of the great Talmudic scholars of our time. 
for 17 years we studied together and at one point he wanted to ordain me rabbi uh, he had a tremendous influence of course i had Baba Cherebi, whom i met yeah. and uh, heschel was a very close friend very very dear friend so i i am yeah. not alone I mean, yeah. I, I'm uh, some of influences you met the the rebbe of course you went drinking good. with him <laughs> no 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 people, people were very look i never accepted to be his Hasid or his follower. Right. For the very first time we met. And therefore, each time we met, it was a kind of joke. He said, Well, are you becoming a yeah, Lubavitcher? Right, right. No, 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 I no. remain a Lubavitcher. Yeah. But we, we were, really, the relationship was a very great relationship of friendship. Friendship. Very great. Yeah. I, I respected and admired the man. I want to talk a little bit about the future. Uh, this book ends in 1969 yeah. with your marriage. Mm -hmm. Marion. <coughs> Why only to 1969? I because have another the, volume. I know you do. Uh, I know. And the title of the other volume is going to be? The, the second verse, the second half of the verse from, of the Ecclesiastes. From Ecclesiastes. And the sea is never full. Yeah. So all the and that's from King Solomon? King Solomon's Ecclesiastes. Yes. Um, what profits hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun, one generation possesseth the way, and another giveth away, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also riseth, and the sun goeth it down, and says to lie place where he, where he arose, and it goes on. Uh, the mission that you feel in 30 books, um, and all that you have, the attention you have received, what, what drives you in part is to make sure that memory of the Holocaust remains what? Remains a burning and luminous scar on our very being now until the end of times. How? I believe that the goal of teaching, of writing, is to sensitize the reader, to sensitize the pupil, to sensitize each other. <clears throat> I would like to create sensitivity, a heightened sensitivity, a heightened awareness of the other in, in those who read me or those who hear me. Otherwise, memory could be a static memory. So memory at some point we say there was a terrible war between 19... 40 and 1945, in which millions of people were killed. Six million Jews were including massacred. Including six million, or, and then at some point, it's no longer six million Jews. It's 20 million people were killed, and there were terrible inhumanities committed. And there's no mention of Jews, and there's no mention of forgotten. Auschwitz. Yes, forgotten. And all of a sudden, it fails in the memory other than. A sentence. In man's inhumanity to man. man in, yeah. It was a time of man's inhumanity, the most obscene inhumanity right. of all time. No, I would like the faces that I have seen, the fires that I have watched from a very near distance should not be extinguished. Neither the faces nor the fires. I would like the tears I have shed, that I have seen others shed, should not be lost in the sand of the desert. How do you feel about this project that Steven Spielberg? It's an important one. Spielberg is a great movie maker. <coughs> and, uh, He's recording the testimony some 50, of all 000, that live. Some 50,000 survivors. Some 50, he chose 50,000 survivors, yes, people everywhere. And it's important for the, for the archive, it's important for memory, sure. Yeah. Whatever we do for the, cost, for the sake of memory, I'm for it. Has there ever been a day in your life that you didn't think? No. Not one day? Not one, but it doesn't prevent me from laughing. Yes. From singing, from loving, from loving, from being uh, celebrating friendship and, and be with my wife, my yeah. son, my friends. You are a shy man, they say. That is shy. Yeah. You quote Pascal as saying, what, uh, what's that great line <laughs> about um, 
God says I. Le moi est haïssable, in French. The I is hateful. Only God can say I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in a sense, your work is all about memory and, in a sense, all ground in your own experience. Not really, Charlie, because I have written very little about not Holocaust. Not memoir, not memoir, but if it's someone else's stories, it comes out of your, the passion of oh. your life. The passion for learning. I've written about the Bible, I've written about the Talmud, about right. Hasidism, about Messianism, I've written plays, I've written cantatas, I've written novels. Well, is that why you haven't written this until now? Exactly. Is this why you couldn't go back to your village until now and write about it until now? Because it was very deep in me. And I didn't want to take it out yet. Before you write, you must acquire an, an intensity and work on it. And the intensity must at one point explode. And when it explodes, you write. You knew it's Akrabi. You covered, you were there um, in 67 at the war. We spoke about it. We last spoke about Tuesday. this two days ago. Uh, tell me finally what <coughs> what worries you the most about the future of your country. This, this, this is my country. I know I don't mean it that way, but this country that you love and your yeah. people. It's the same thing that I that I worry about really with regard to other people in other countries. It's it fanaticism. is fanaticism. Yeah. Just. Imagine nuclear fanaticism. It's possible. You know, I, I, I met recently uh, the director of the FBI, who became a very close friend, Louis Free. Right. He's a marvelous human being. You should have him on your program. And we spoke about nuclear terrorism. And I said, you know, when I was younger, 30 years ago, a friend took me to see a computer. It filled two rooms. Now you take a computer, you put it in your pocket. Yeah. It's possible that 10 years from now, a, a nuclear explosion. In a, in a, in a uh, attache case. That's exactly it. Mm. But fanaticism, it's not the weapon. Oh, no. It it's is the fanaticism of it. the mind. You know? sure. And you said I, here on this program, a Jew killed a Jew in Israel, a prime minister, a general, and shot him in the back. In the back. How could that happen? Fanaticism. 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 Whatever really happened, bad, bad things that happened now in recent years, that you try to trace them back, you will see it is always fanaticism. It's not only uh, religious fanaticism, it's ethnic fanaticism in Bosnia. Fanaticism started, and, uh, in, in which Bosnia. you have written about eloquently, and it is fanaticism that started World War I, and fanaticism Sarajevo. started World War II. Too. Always fanaticism. You think there's fanaticism in this country? Absolutely. From the right, from the left? From the right, even from the left, but maybe from the right. And these are, these are very dangerous people. Driven by religious? Racism. And racism. Racism. Maybe there it's racism. Anti-Semitism, racism? Always. Whenever people hate, they always find a place to hate a Jew too. To blame. First the Jew also. They, play some, they hate rich. Put in a few Jews. They hate the black. Put in a few Jews too. They always hate Jews, Why is but that? not only Jews, because we are the scapegoat. Some say because we were the conscience 3,000 years ago of humanity, because, and because we are alive. They cannot understand. Logically, our people should have disappeared. There wasn't a time, there wasn't a method when Jews were not in danger since 3,500 years. And they can't understand. What are you doing here? We don't want you. Go away. And we stay and contribute. Elie Wiesel, Memories, All Rivers Run to the Sea. Um, thank you. Thank you, Pleasure. When we come back,